All right, well, here we are. Welcome back. This is Breakfast with the Bible. Um, we're not doing the journey through the Psalms today. I wanted to, top, I wanted to jump over to something else uh, that I found interesting and I kind of wanted to share with you. So today we're going to speak on what we call the Beatitudes. And most of us are familiar with that, that phrase. Um, we were taught it, you know, even as a young child to memorize them. Um, if we were in Sunday school or, or Bible study or even youth groups. And most of us as Christians at any time in our life will come across these and will hear these and they're, they're a common theme in scripture memorization. Excuse me. So I'd like to, I'd like to go through it. Now, I want to walk through them and consider each. And I also want to submit to you a couple of things that first, they are not universal. These, these are not, um, it, it, I'm going to explain to you why it, it appears that the audience that Jesus was talking to was not just everyone. These were people he considered disciples. Now, we know that he ended up only with 12 minus one, uh, and so on. But we could, we could easily assume that this, this group that he's, he's talking to are people who are, are following him. Now, this isn't just, just because he's cool or, or whatever, but they're, they, they sit under his teaching. They want to hear from him. So Jesus is putting them in the category of disciples or those, those who are being taught. So I want, to, I want to submit that these these Beatitudes, as we would call them, are not universal and that they're sequential, that, that primarily they go in order in, in degree of maturity, in degree of walk with Christ. And I have a various, various ways of explaining that. And then I also want to, by way of example, point out each one uh, in the life of Peter. So with, our, with the time that we have, I'd like to, like I said, I'd like to explain why they're not universal, they're sequential, and I'll give you an example in Peter's life. Now, I wanted to figure out what the word beatitude actually meant, because for the longest time, it just seemed like something that was made up. So Webster's 1828 defines this word as blessedness, Felicity of the highest kind, use of the joys of heaven, or supreme happiness. So this is like the the, the beatitudes is to is is like the the pinnacle of happiness, the pinnacle of understanding blessedness in God or in Christ. So um, I'll be I'll begin reading through it. I'll just read. Like I said, we usually go just we'll go from uh, verse one in. Matthew chapter 5 to verse 12. So it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you men when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So um, if we can look at Luke chapter 6 for one moment, this is where I want to qualify um, the fact that Jesus is speaking to whom he considers disciples. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 3, and 
it is. I, my notes are all over the place. So Luke chapter 3, 3, no, I'm sorry, chapter 6, excuse me. I was looking at verse, verse 3. Uh, so we'll go to chapter 6, verse 17. And he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for they, there went virtue out of him, and he healed them. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, and the following verses are very, very similar to the, the Beatitudes that we find in Matthew chapter 5. So if Luke is referring to the same events, as Matthew chapter 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount, then the term disciples is qualified by Luke in his gospel account as a large crowd of his disciples, not to mention a great throng of people. Concerning this large crowd of people, Luke continues and writes, and turning his gaze toward his disciples, thus the great mass of people also comprised his disciples. Now, there's no real suggestion that this this instance in Luke's account is different than the one in Matthew. Jesus' ministry lasted three years, and he he didn't travel much much farther than this this one, you know, these few groups of areas. So his audience generally would have been the same people. So the likelihood of Jesus teaching the same thing twice to the same people was probably not not happening as much. Because Jesus, of course, knew how long his ministry was going to be, um, so he only had a certain amount of time to get everything out there. So that is why I'd like to suggest, and, and really, the, the verses themselves in Matthew chapter 5 really only point to the possibility of it being a follower of Christ, because, and we'll go there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, obviously we know as Christians that the kingdom of heaven does not belong to the unsaved. There's answer number one. But who are the poor in spirit? And this is why we're going to go through sequence too. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is, this is beatitude. This is blessing. This is happiness number one. Poor in spirit is the acknowledgement of... Um, of, of our inability to do it on our own, to, to make it on our own. It's the opposite of pride that says, I don't need a savior. This is the, this is the humility that says, I do. I'm poor in spirit. I'm not, I'm not sufficient on my own to do what needs to be done. So this is our first recognition of our need for Christ. This is poor in spirit. And, and when we recognize that, we know that it says that there's is the, that's the kingdom of heaven. So, our first step towards repentance, towards salvation, is an understanding that we can't do it by ourselves. Then we look at verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Now, I'm going to, to really focus on the spiritual level of, this, of these verses, not necessarily the horizontal, because we know that, you know, we mourn for lost loved ones, we, we mourn for those who passed away, we mourn for various reasons. But I'd like to suggest that this verse is, is more so concerning the mourning over our sin. So we recognize, verse 3, we're poor in spirit. We recognize our need for Christ. Verse 4, we mourn over our sin. We mourn because now we see it as it's supposed to be seen. We look at our sin and go, how could I have offended God in such a way? So it is, it is grieving over your sin. This is in 1 Thessalonians. If I can go there real quick, um, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So why is it that this verse is only for believers? It says, they will be comforted. Now, there is no comfort promised to those who 
aren't followers of Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, Paul's talking to the church in Thessalonica, saying, don't be ignorant about those who are, who are dead. He's talking about the dead in Christ shall rise and, and, and whatnot. Concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not. He's saying, don't be sorry in such a way um, because they're gone, but rejoice because you'll see them again. He says, but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So, who are the ones who have no hope? Those are the ones who, by their choice to reject Christ, are not going to see any saved loved ones in heaven. This, there's no comfort there. There's no hope there. So, when, when Christ says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, he has to be speaking to in that in that day we'd call them believers or followers or disciples to us he'd, he'd have to be talking to christians real true bible believing christians because anybody anybody other than that would not be comforted by this kind of verse verse five blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth now the meek again this is kind of a, a humility thing but it's a different kind of humility than we find in verse three verse three was the opposite of the pride in self-sufficiency. Self -sufficiency. This is now the humility that, you know, we understand, you know, it's it's opposite of I'm, I'm better than you because I'm a Christian. This is the, I still recognize my need for a savior and that I'm, I'm, I'm nobody without him. In that I'm not better than those who are not saved, in that I'm still, we're still created in the image of God, and they deserve a chance at the gospel just as much as I did. So it's it's the opposite of, of, of the pharisaical look, way of looking at things, like, thank God I'm not like this guy over there. So that is that is the opposite of what that is. And then if we look at verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, an unbeliever is not going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. An unbeliever is going to hunger and thirst after whatever makes them happy, whatever fills their cup, whatever, you know, floats their boat, melts their cheese, however you want to put it. This is a, you know, and it, again, it's sequential. We're poor in spirit. We recognize our need for a Savior. We mourn over our sin. God promises comfort because there's, there's comfort in that forgiveness that we get. Blessed are the meek. Now we're humble because we recognize that not only were we insufficient without Christ, now without Christ we can do nothing. And that we acknowledge that any good thing that comes from us, that, that we produce, is not really from us. We're just the vessel in which, which the Holy Spirit uses. And then, blessed are they which do hunger. There's there's more growth there. There's Now you're, you're beginning to be hungry and thirst after righteousness. You want to push, you want to study the scriptures. You want to become more and more like Christ now that you've been introduced to it. Now you you want to be filled. So again, this is this is primarily sequential. I'm not saying you can't, it can't, they can't each be kind of manifested on their own apart from the other ones, but I believe in the in the life of a Christian, they they should at least to some degree be in order, be sequential, because it's I believe that's where the blessing is at. Blessed are the merciful, verse seven, for they shall obtain mercy. Okay. You've, you've now realized that you hunger and thirst for righteousness because you can do nothing without Christ. And you recognize the forgiveness that you have. You recognize that, that it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, then you want to be more like Christ. Being more like Christ, to be merciful, you forgive others, you love others, and that kind of thing. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Again, there's that sequence. You don't start out pure in heart. 
Okay, you're and, and you're not pure in heart because of anything good that you have. Okay, this purity is this once you're being filled, your your the purity in heart is this um your life has been transformed by the grace of God. You're not sinless, but your position before God has changed. So when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ and not the wretchedness of man. And then verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The, the plural of, uh, excuse me, it's, the, it's they are with peace with God and desire to live in peace with all men. And their peace with Christ enables them to be ambassadors of God's message to a troubled world. Remember when Paul said, if, if whatever lies within you to, to be at peace, live at peace with all man. So if it's within your capability, maintain peace with everybody. Now this peace isn't a condoning of their, their way of life, but... We have to be discerning in those in those things. And then, of course, verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness. And an unbeliever is not going to be purchased, persecuted, persecuted for righteousness sake. They're not going to be persecuted at all um, in the way that Christ is describing here. There's no righteous there to, righteousness there to be persecuted. And for theirs is the kingdom of heaven again. The, the unbelievers don't get to call, don't get that inheritance. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You're not, you're not going to hear persecution and reviling and, and evil spoken against unbelievers falsely for Christ's sake. It's, I mean, obviously. And then verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. The, the Christian who acknowledges these kinds of things, who understands this book to some degree, can rejoice even in persecution because we understand that even so, they persecuted the prophets which were before us. So we can, we can almost accept it with gladness because it's, it's, a, it's a reminder that we are Christ's followers and so the if, if you're not a christian and you're being persecuted there's not going to be as much joy there probably none you're going to complain well how come life is so bad for me and so those are the main reasons why i again i suggest that it's it's these are these are dedicated to christians and that they're in sequence so let me flip my notes around a little bit now, I want to show you by example uh, these individually in the, in the life of Peter. Now, I picked Peter because he's probably one of my favorites, and he's, he's really just kind of a, an expression of real people in, in, in the growth process, you know, where he, he gets kind of impulsive. He's, you know, he's, he's kind of got a hot temper. Um, he, you know, he, he makes mistakes even after he dedicates his life to Christ. And then as growth happens, he becomes a, a, a pillar of the Christian church and, and whatnot. So I, I like him a lot. So if we look at poor in spirit, let's look at Luke chapter five really quick. If you have your Bibles, again, I hope you do. Luke chapter five, verses four to eight. And this is... This is Peter's, Peter's example of being poor in spirit. Verses 4 to 8. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and we have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had, had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, 
for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter starts out here in this passage, I've tried it all. Jesus, I know, I know you're saying cast out right here. We've been out here all night. We haven't caught a single thing. This is self-sufficient, at least self, self-sufficiency speaking. But then Jesus says, try it. Peter says, okay. Then he does it and they catch a multitude of fish. Peter's recognition there says, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Peter has now recognized his need for a savior. That is the poor in spirit. Now, for they that mourn, let's look at Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, verses 54 to 62. I might not have time to finish this. Luke 22, 54 to 62 says, Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. This, listen to this verse. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. This is Peter mourning over his sin. This is, I recognize my need for a Savior. Now I'm mourning over my sin. Now this is, this isn't like right after, but you can see how this example of of you you've claimed to be you you claimed your need for a savior and now you recognize your sinfulness, and even when you do sin, you should mourn. There should be a mourning over each sin that you commit, and in the life of a believer, that should be constant. So the meek. Uh, the, the meek shall inherit the earth. Let's look at John chapter 6. Chapter, verses 68 and 69. Then Simon Peter answered him. This is right after many of his disciples fell away. When Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and, and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's no pride there. Peter is, who else has the answer? Where, where else would we go? Your, your hunger, your, your, your recognizing just how much you have in Christ and his everything. Uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to try to hurry a little bit because I might run out of time here and I'll lose my whole video. Um, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 30. Uh, let's see. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But... The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the, wave, the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter was hungry. Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. Hungry. He was hungry and, thir and thirsty for righteousness, for, for Christ. Christ is the ultimate righteousness. Peter is, is hungry for that. You know, or, or Lord, teach us to pray. There's hunger and thirst there. Lord, teach us, teach us how, to, how to 
speak to the Father like you speak to the Father. Or let's look at blessed are the merciful. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we'll read verses 1 to 10. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Is that this mercy? Peter saw a need. And... He stopped, and he showed mercy upon this man, and he healed him. Blessed are the pure in heart. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verses 16 and 17. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, I'm going to submit to you that this is the result of Peter seeing God. So he's got to be pure in heart to some degree. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter, to some degree, has seen God at that point because God's revealed something to him. God's revealed a truth to his spirit, to his heart, to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are the peacemakers. The difference between here is, is between Peter with a sword and then his willingness to suffer in the book of Acts. There's a, he, he's, he's at peace. He wants to keep peace. So now he's not swinging swords and ripping off men's ears. He's now accepting the penalty of, of being a believer. He's now willing willing to suffer in such a way and even requests to be hung upside down crucified upside down at, at one at the end of his life because of his willingness to suffer for Christ's sake blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake this is in acts chapter 4 as well as Acts chapter 5. So let's look at chapter 4 real quick. Acts chapter 4, 1 to 3. And as they spake unto the temple, the priests, unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. So there is persecution there. Stop preaching in Jesus' name. And they put him in chains. And then we look at chapter 5, verses 17 to 32. This is when the apostles suffered persecution. Then the high priest rose up, all that they were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison, and then this is when um, the angel shook, uh, shook the earth and the bars opened up and they all came out. Or I'm sorry, that's when Paul and Silas, this is when the angel gets them out and there's no indication that they even open the doors. So again, this is persecution because you're speaking the name of Christ. There's no persecution in that way for those who don't speak the name of Christ. You're not, you're not losing anything. And then it kind of goes along with, you know, blessed are you who are reviled and, and falsely spoken evil of. And then salt and light. If we look a little bit further in, in the Beatitudes, just after um, those 
that passage starting in verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. And then verse 14, you are the light of the world. This is sequential again because after all of these instances that we've seen in Peter's life, he goes on to be salt and light. He goes on to preach the gospel to the churches. He goes on to, to be a powerful man in the hands of God. So the Beatitudes are for us as Christians. Now, it's a, it's a good a good way of being even if you aren't but the promises don't exist for you if you're not a Christian I mean we should be poor in spirit even if we're not a believer we should be mourning over you know our sin we should be meek we should be hungry and thirsty for righteousness we should be merciful we should be pure in heart but these things the way Christ described them are, are directly related to the Christian believer and not the rest of the world. Is it is it true that the crowd could have been people who are spec you know speculative of Christ? Of course. But Jesus is 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 trying to describe those who inherit the kingdom. So this is this is why I believe and I'm sure that most of you would hopefully agree that this is to those who would follow Christ in such a way to inherit the kingdom. And then I hope you can see the sequence in this, in the life of a believer, how we should kind of graduate from one to the other. Now we should consistently go back and mourn over our sin and whatnot, and we should always be meek and we should always recognize our, our poorness of spirit without Christ. So I hope it, it blessed you in some way. Sorry, it was kind of jumbled. My notes were all over the place because I I kind of wrote in, in, in different ways as I was studying. So uh, stick around. We'll have another video coming around soon. I hope to be in Psalm 60 uh, very, very soon to continue our journey through the Psalms. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Like, subscribe, share, do all those cool things you people do when you're on here. And uh, we'll see you next time. God bless.